I think we can get started. It's uh, it's uh, three minutes into the event. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Yu Wu, and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this Kinova and MathWorks joint webinar. In this webinar, we are going to show you a template for developing professional robotics manipulator applications. And this template will help you to implement robot from perception to motion. So before we start, we would like to introduce the presenters to you today. And yeah, Ronald, would you like to kick it off? Yeah. yeah. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ronald George. I'm an application engineer here at the MathWorks. Um, so as an application engineer, I'm a technical point of contact uh, focusing on robotics and autonomous systems. So any toolboxes under those, I'll be a primary point of contact. I've been with the MathWorks for about um, a year and a half, a little under two years now, prior to which I was doing my master's at North Carolina State University, uh, focusing on distributed systems and multi-agent planning. Martin, do you want to go next? Yes, so hi everyone, I'm Martin. Uh, basically at Canova, I'm Ronald's counterpart. I'm a senior software developer and a client application designer. I've been with Kinova for three years, and prior to that, I was finishing my master's degree in mechanical engineering and robotics. With me is Marc-André. Yes, thank you, Martin. So uh, I'm Marc-André, the marketing coordinator at Kinova. Uh, I have a background in industrial automation, working for a Canada-wide distributor in the past. Uh, mainly at Kinova, I support the sales force by producing marketing tools and contributing to the uh, content strategy. Uh, for our website, social media, uh, partners, and distributor channels. And my name is Yu. I'm the robotics industry marketing manager at MathWorks. And uh, I, before joining MathWorks, I did my PhD training in robotics at MIT. And I also was working at a company where we deploy robots into water pipelines to ins perform inspection. And today, it's a great pleasure to uh, have uh, deliver this presentation to all of you. And in this presentation, we are going to mainly have Rano and Mark and, uh, and Rano and Martin to uh, show you some of the capabilities and how to use the template to develop your applications. And uh, myself and Mark and Dre will be monitoring the chat window. So if you have any questions, feel free to post your questions in the chat, and we will bring it up to the presenters. A little bit, a few words about MathWorks. So some of you may uh, may be familiar with our tool called MATLAB, and some of you may be, some, uh, even a smaller number of you may be familiar with Simulink. And uh, but you, what you may not know is we also have over 100 other products, we call them toolboxes, that can help you uh, implement a lot of your engineering uh, projects at a much faster pace. And today, Ronald is going to show you a few of them. We are a company based in Natick, Massachusetts. It's outside Boston. And we have about 4,000 engineers in the company right now to support you uh, in your applications. Yes, for, so for about Kinova, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the company, I will try to summarize our story in a few words. So the company started when our, one of our co-founders, Charles, who graduated, graduated from engineering school, uh, was inspired by his uncle's idea for assistive, uh, an assistive robotic arm, who would later become known as Jayco. Almost 15 years ago, Kinova has evolved its product line and product offering to answer the needs of professional markets, uh, like research uh, with the Kinova Gentry arm, uh, and later on, uh, the Gentry Lite, which is mainly used for educational purposes, uh, through strategic partnerships and collaborative efforts, Kinova was able to develop uh, afterwards uh, a new product specifically developed and designed for the medical market. Uh, the product is uh, mainly a, a key part of a platform for robotic assisted endoscopy, uh, but I cannot tell you more of this, but it's a really a, a very cool product. Um, now I will let Martin go over the next slides and discuss with you some of the use cases and um, typical challenges that our clients have tackled over the years. So let's go, Martin. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mark Conway. So uh, my role today will be to go over some of the typical use cases we see our users trying to accomplish with their robots. And hopefully later on in the presentation, Ronald will be able to help us try to uh, adapt the template we'll be presenting to those applications. 
So first to start, one, one thing that's common to most development cycles for a robotics application are to start in simulation. Simulation is something that's really convenient for many reasons. The first one being that you don't have to have physical access to your robot. And um, also you'd never risk actually breaking anything. If something fails in simulation, it, it doesn't cost you anything. All you have to do is reboot. So whenever you're building a simulation, you might want to do this to test your control algorithms, or maybe you're in the initial proof of concept part of a project and you need to figure out how you will organize your workspace. And finally, one uh, application that's typical for uh, simulation is a training AI. So whenever you want to train an AI, for example, for controlling a robot, it's much more convenient to have multiple robots run in parallel and train them all at the same time. And But if you can do that with a single computer running multiple simulations instead of having to buy uh, dozens or hundreds of robots to run, then it's much more cost effective. Then moving on to actual uh, on the field application, one of the most typical use cases we have is teleoperation. The videos you're seeing here are from one of our research partners named Aption. The device you're seeing is using a haptics control to be able to move the robot in the same way you're using the controller. So the robot is uh, imitating the motion of your hand. This can be useful to control the robot at a distance and replicate the precise motion by a professional, but you, you might have uh, many different kinds of inputs for uh, teleoperation. Uh, you could have a simple joystick, a game controller, or even you could have adapted interfaces such as eye tracking or even brain computer interfaces. So all, all of those can be applied in many uh, applications. Uh, now moving on to our second use case. This one is really close to the heart of Kenova. As Marc-André mentioned earlier, our, our company was started with robot for assistive purposes. So we're very used to having robots working close in, in close collaboration with people. So the use case you're seeing here is from another of our research partners. It's a feeding application, but human robot collaboration and close collaboration, it goes way beyond just assistive robots. Nowadays you can have, uh, can have robots sharing the workspace of a worker on an assembly floor picking and placing objects from a conveyor belt to a working table or just passing tools like that. And it's important for this kind of application to have a lot of safety feature to make sure that the, the robot never puts the user next to him uh, in danger. Next is the main use case we'll be tackling on today. So this is vision-based pick and place. This can be done in multiple ways. You can have an external camera picking up the target of your robot and moving on directly to it. Or you can have the camera tracking the robot and then adapting as you move the input from the controller based on the vision to be able to pick an object. This can be used in any sort of application. Sometimes even if you're... Uh, if your environment is not controlled, if your objects are in any place that's are hard to predict, all you have to do is slap on a camera on your system and you can get your robot to pick your objects anyway. So now that we've seen uh, all, all sorts of typical applications we can see with uh, our robots, we can. I'm moving on to Ronald who will explain to us how we can tackle them using MATLAB. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for um, explaining the different applications, Martin. Um, so, as you all saw, there were multiple applications that the Kinova arm has been used in. Um, I want to take a look at um, some of the common challenges that uh, we, we are faced with when we start building these autonomous systems. Um, it, as you saw in the examples, um, there's, there's a lot of different domains that have to come together to establish an entire workflow. Um, we, we looked at like detecting and estimating the, the position of an object. We looked at planning trajectories to move, an, move the arm from a desired location, from the starting location to a desired location. And of course, we have to consider integrating all these systems together. Uh, these algorithms can be extremely complex. Um, there's, there's optimization of robotics, there's computer vision, controls, um, some code generation. Um, also, when, when we talk about um, an entire 
uh, autonomous system, you have to also look at end-to-end -end work. This is starting from the design of the system, moving towards doing simulations to validate and verify the design of the system. And then of course, deploying this uh, to have a full end-to-end -end pipeline. As you know, there's, there's safety involved when it comes to working with robots uh, that, and each of these domains have a decent amount of technical depth and you have to analyze the stability of the system to, uh, to make sure the performance is exactly what you expect. So um, now that I've walked through some of the um, complexities, I wanna look at some of the components that are part of the system. So we were using Simlink and a, a pick and place template to kind of walk through how you can use the template that we have and how you can modify this template to, uh, to achieve the different applications. That we have. So as you see in front of you here, we have a Simlink model for, for those who are unaware. Um, Simlink is an environment where um, you can you can model um, whole systems very similar to how you would start drawing systems on a whiteboard. So when we look at a pick and place application, you have to first have a planner, a planner that has a sequence of tasks. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'll walk through each of those steps as we go through. Uh, you should be able to connect to your robot. This can be an actual hardware implementation of the robot. Uh, it can be a robot in an external simulator. It can also be um, an in-house Simlink simulation of the robot. So you have to have a mathematical representation of the robot. Then we have the camera. Um, this is our main sensory device. This is what will give us our sense input. We'll take that sensory in information, be it um, a depth camera, point cloud, or just a 2D um, raw image and we'll send that to an object detector as we have to identify um, the pose of the object, extract the uh, actual object to move to that location. Once we know where, um, where our object is with reference to our end effector, we have to plan. We have to plan a motion that actually takes us from where the start location of the end effector is to where that object is. And then we have to go through a, another sequence of tasks. So, as you see through, we, we walked through multiple stages here. Well, we started with the platform. Um, then we moved into sensing, which was actually bringing in uh, image data and point cloud information. We walked through building sort of a perception algorithm, and I'll talk more about that as we go through the slides. Uh, we have to have a scheduler and a planner that, um, that generates the trajectory for the, the actual robot arm to move to the location to actuate the gripper, grab the object, and then move to another location. And of course, there's you know, when you talk about this, there's also control involved. You have to analyze the response of the robot, make sure that you're minimizing the errors, so you have to have a feedback. Now, the same template that we looked at a second ago, I've overlaid how each, each block that we were looking at actually is a part of this um, of this overall components that we designed. So MATLAB and Simlink actually give you a, a ton of toolboxes for you to for you to start off quickly and start building these applications from the get-go. Um, starting with controls, like Simlink has been involved in controls for a very long time, uh, going from classic controls to modern control, looking at ro robust or nonlinear control, or model predictive control. We have toolboxes that give you a lot of inbuilt functionality to get started and to improve on algorithms that we give you. Looking at sensing, we have the image processing toolbox, we have the LiDAR toolbox, and of course we have sense of fusion and tracking toolbox, all to help you with those algorithms. In perception, uh, we have computer vision toolbox, we have deep learning toolbox, and we look at how you can use some of these tools to build, build out the algorithm. We'll look at how we use these toolboxes to build out the pick and place algorithm. Uh, for the platform and for planning, we have robotic systems toolbox. For the platform specifically, we have Simscape multi-body. And uh, for planning, we have navigation, which gives you a ton of planning algorithms to get you started. So Ronald, the, I have been building robot applications for the last eight years. And I remember eight years ago, we have to go through the exact same kind of workflow to write a code for each component step by step, and everything is hard-coded. So today, I guess you're going to show us how much it is easier now to build a similar application. And rather than like six years ago, it would take me six months to build on this. Now we can build it really quickly. 
So to start, we always try to look at how we are connecting with the robot platform first. Can you show us how it is done now in MATLAB? Oh, that's a great question because that's a good segue into my next slide, actually. So with this robot in particular, uh, Kinova actually built an API for us that we, we make it really easy. So if you're using Robotic Systems Toolbox, you can go and add um, an additional support package that for right now only supports the Kinova, but we're adding more robots into this. And as you see to your right here, uh, once you add this support package, you can easily set up and connect to the Kinova robot. And then you get a, a ton of functionality that you can use right out of the box. Uh, Martin, do you wanna talk a little bit about the API that you built? Yes, of course. So the Kinova API on Gen 3 is based on our Cortex platform API. Uh, on MATLAB, we wrapped up many of those functions that will allow you to perform the main task you would be you would expect to be able to perform with a robot. So you can you can control your robot in Angular and Cartesian position. You can even send a fully detailed trajectory defined uh, every millisecond, and you will be able to control your robot like this. Uh, in addition to this, we also have for advanced users an external API that you can use outside of MATLAB for more advanced features such as store control, uh, etc. And one advantage of using the Cortex API like this is that uh, whenever you would be you building your template and you would want to change the robot platform, you would usually have to rewrite a driver for the robot from scratch. But by using the Cortex API, you're, com uh, you're compatible with all the Gen 3 robots. This includes Gen 3 and Gen 3 Lite, as well as all of our future uh, development robots. Thanks, Martin. So let's let's take a look at just with the API how you can do some um, how you can get some uh, output from the robot. So here you can see that we we, we use the API to build uh, a quick little app. Being MATLAB, it's very easy to build apps. This app lets you connect to the robot. Uh, you can send the robot to home position. You can open the gripper. Or you can add waypoints so that the robot can actually reach those waypoints. You can load these waypoints from a file. So here we're just looking at like the output, right? We're giving control commands to the robot and the robot's performing. When we talk about pick in place, we also have another aspect, which is our input. And here we actually use um, an image acquisition adapter that Kinova had built for us. With that, we get to bring in both RGB uh, data and depth information. So what you see in front of here is um, a point cloud uh, that we are able to extract from the camera. Once we have that point cloud, we can use our computer vision toolbox to uh, segment this image so we can segment this data so we can see what the table is and pull out where the objects are. We can then use uh, our denoising filters that we've built in uh, to actually get a, a much clearer um, representation of the object. And now this is important because that's our first piece, right? Uh, I'm going to move through the next pieces. So we looked at how we're going to bring in data from the camera, and we looked at how we're going to send control commands to the robot. So Ronald, before you move on to the next piece, uh, if I want to have accurate measurements and of position of my objects when I detect them with the camera, I need to be able to perform camera calibration. So how, how can MATLAB help, help us do that? Great question. So we do have a camera calibration app um, within MATLAB itself. It comes, it comes right uh, along with the tools. Um, it's in the computer vision toolbox, of course. So we can use sort of a, a standard checkerboard calibration. You would have to set up your camera and then have uh, a checkerboard square placed in front of it. You can take multiple, uh, you can send your camera to multiple positions and take different um, images of that checkerboard. And once you do that, uh, you can go into the camera calibration app. You can enter the size of the actual square within the checkerboard. And with that, you're going to receive your uh, uh, the relative position of the camera with respect to the checkerboard. So you can calibrate all of your uh, camera's intrinsic parameters directly using that camera calibration app. Uh, great, thanks. Absolutely. So um, looking a little further, we looked at sense. We looked at, we talked about the platform, connecting to the platform. We looked at bringing in data from the camera itself, and we looked at actually sending this data back. But there's there is some autonomous tasks that we have to do in between here. Uh, one being, of course, perception. 
we have to make sure that once we once we see the once we see the image, we're able to extract what object we want to get to and the pose of that object. So then we can move on to the planning and the decision making uh, aspects of the entire template. So let me go ahead and open the actual model up so you can actually I can walk you through the model. So what you see in front of you here is the Simlink model that we are using. Uh, this is the template that we were looking at. We have a task planner here. We have the API or the, the connection to the hardware. We have our object detector. I'll walk through in a couple of slides how we built that. And then we have our motion planner. Uh, let me go a little deeper into this so you can see. So there's a couple, um, couple aspects to our entire planner. Now this is built using a tool called Stateflow. Um, it's an event place planner, um, sort of like a scheduler if you think about it. So it goes through the process of setting up, uh, opening the gripper, moving to scanning poses. I'm actually going to run this so you can you can see how how um, the model actually performs. Um, so the first thing is you'll see that we have an image. Now we're running this in simulation. I haven't connected to the robot yet. Uh, the first step we do as specified by our planner is move to a scan position. So this is go to scanning position as you see. So this is the first task we, we've uh, predetermined for the robot. We start from its home position and we move the robot to a scanning position. Uh, it's the position that's gonna be right above the objects that we wanna recognize. Um, to do this as a simulation, we also use a, a static image. So we're gonna test out how this functionality will work before we actually move it to the hardware. As, as Martin explained during the applications portion, simulation is an important aspect of testing and ver verifying your algorithm. So here, we move the robot to a scanning position, and then we run uh, an object detection algorithm on the actual static image. And you can see now we have detected where these objects are in front of us. Then after we move that, we go to our picking pose. So now we're gonna move our robot further down. We've, we've decided that we're gonna go pick up the membrane. This is predetermined uh, and I can show you how we did that. We're gonna go move to actually pick up the, the membrane. So let me stop this for now and show you how we, how we automated these tasks. So with Simlink, there's, there's uh, a lot of functionality that lets you um, automate some of these tasks. So as you can see here, we built a little small block that lets you say, all right, uh, I wanna run this in automatic mode or I wanna run this in manual mode and I can decide multiple objects that I wanna go pick. And this is all customizable as you'd like. So you can test out uh, if I run it in automatic and I decide I wanna pick the mug first and then the membrane, or if I go in manual and say, I wanna pick the membrane, how your, how your robot's gonna respond. So going further, let's, uh, let's actually see when we move out of simulation, and when we run into the actual robot, how this performs. Well, one thing that you noticed, uh, or you might have noticed, in the simulation, we placed some obstacles that weren't actually there. But when in the hardware, we knew those obstacles are going to be there, so we can plan around those obstacles. And I'll talk a little more about um, planning for obstacles and creating virtual boundaries. Here you can see now this is the robot in actual action. We're able to go pick up, identify that membrane, as you can see the image here. We pick that membrane, and then we are able to take it to the uh, its actual place uh, position. We come there, and we're able to drop that in its place. And it did route around an obstacle that we had planned for. So this is actually doing this in real time with the uh, with the hardware connected. Here we do the operation on the mug now. We, we pick up the mug, uh, we route around uh, the obstacle that we placed there, or PVC pipes that we have, and we're able to move that cup and place it on the saucer. So Rano, so I think this one is the automatic mode where you're picking up both objects. In the That's case of a, for example, a teleoperation or brain computer interface, where we want to direct the robot to pick up the mug or the or the, uh, the uh, orange object uh, with our mind. 
how could you uh, modify the template to accommodate for that? Great question. All right, so uh, you're right, you. This was this was an automated script, right? I have a task planner that's going to decide what the next action is and what I want to do next. One thing that I do have control over is uh, a user command block that we put in. So here, right now, I'm I'm on pick selected mode. Uh, when I go and change this to automatic mode, you will see that it goes and goes to pick all mode. So I get to control, as a user, I get to control what it does. Now, when, when you talk about, say, a brain-human interface, this block, the user command block, is what you're going to modify. And I have a small um, like variant that I've put in here. So here, all you would do is you would have the brain-computer interface provide, say, a brain wave or a signal that you would then analyze to classify as, is this play is the is the human asking me for pick all? Is he asking me to pick a specific object? So you would only come in here and modify the user command uh, uh, block. So you'd modify one block to get that uh, moving into place. Now you also asked about teleoperation. Uh, in terms of teleoperation, there's not um, there are not multiple tasks that you have to, uh, actually move through. Instead, you you'll have a device that you would read sensor data from. This could be uh, just joint positions or it could be encoders that you're reading from. You would read that and then um, replay that onto the robot API. Now, in some cases, uh, just for safety concerns, you wouldn't directly just go and replay that on the robot. Instead, you would maybe process that information slightly. Uh, your your teleoperation ro uh, device may be able to reach a, a larger work environment, or maybe um, there's a safety barrier that the robot should not cross, across, but your teleoperation device can cross that. So you might have to process that, but you would actually change this task planner to, to fit that specific teleoperation. I hope that answers your question. Yep. Perfect. That's, pre that's pretty impressive, uh, Ronald. Uh, regarding vision, uh, how would you adapt the Simulink template if I was to use um, an external camera, let's say uh, a Cognex versus the uh, onboard camera on the, the Kinova Gentry? I see, I see. So instead of using the camera that's built onto the wrist here, you want to use an external camera to identify the objects. So here, um, as Martin asked before, um, we, we do our camera calibration using the camera on the wrist. Now, when it comes to using an external camera to identify these objects, you would have to cap calibrate the camera, and with that, you'll get the you'll get a relative pose of the camera to the object, and you would also know the relative pose of the camera to the robot arm. So, using those two transforms, you would have to modify uh, what the expected position of the object is. So, a little bit of uh, transform calculation, and you should be able to derive where the position of the object is in reference to the actual end of it. Great. Awesome. So um, we looked at the overall operation. We looked at how we can bring in data from the sensor. We looked at how we can send commands. But well, the next thing we want to look at is actually building this object detection algorithm, right? Because the object detection automatically decides where the object is in reference to the, the robot. So here we, I'm showing our robot actually building a set of uh, our, what we call our training data set. So because we have the API, we're able to send the, the end effector to multiple different positions. Um, we actually send it to about 600 different positions to take uh, a ton of images. And this is common in, um, in sort of a deep learning network where you have to have a, a sizable data set. Uh, we provide tools for you to take that data set and augment it by um, flipping it, by creating you know, uh, additional images if you don't want to take a ton of images. So that's the first step, taking all the data. Uh, the next step is actually labeling this data. And that's actually a very uh, time consuming effort. Uh, one of the benefits of using MATLAB and Simlink is we have an app called the Image Labeler app. What this does is you can take about, um, say, the first 20 images that you have 
Uh, you can feed the entire data set to the image label, labeler app. Go through the first 10 or 20 uh, once you have all the objects and label the first 10 or 20. And then you can actually automate the labeling process for the rest of the frames. This can be done with images or it can be done with an actual video feed. It'll just break it into frames. So that saves you a lot of time. So here what we did is we labeled about 20 images and then had our image labeler app go ahead and label the rest of the images. Now you might have to sift through um, these images to make sure that uh, your labeler uh, and your network is actually labeling them correctly. So you might have to modify some images. As you can see here, the membrane is behind the mug and maybe that can cause some confusion for your overall network. Um, if you don't want to train these networks by yourself, you don't want to go from scratch, we actually have a deep network designer app too. Um, so you can start with a, a pre-existing network, say AlexNet or GoogleNet, that, that recognizes some of the objects and has been trained to recognize some of the objects that uh, you're, you're trying to estimate or identify. So you can start with that and then add layers to this as you'd like. So, Say if you took the AlexNet and you had, you know, it, it identifies food and, and um, objects such as mugs, and you only really care about two of those objects. You can start improving the, the algorithm by adding different layers to make it more robust for your specific application. So you can improve the performance for yours. You can, uh, I was just gonna say, you can modify this with our deep network designer very easily as you can see all the layers and build up the layers. So Ronald, let's say that the robotics application I'm interested in building using your template is actually the automation of collecting pictures as seen on the left on your slide. That I imagine I would have to move the camera block on the Simulink model somewhere else. So if, you, if you're only trying to get, um, so uh, here we actually use our camera to provide the planning or the trajectory to our robot, right? Uh, we're using our camera as the, the input to decide where we want the robot to move. In your application, it will be slightly different. You would provide the inputs of where you want to move to, and then, then you would take images. So you would just, um, instead of having the camera decide where the, where the robot's going to move to, your task planner is going to have those set of tasks move to this position, move to this position, move to this position. And then at each of those positions, you would just take images, which is what we did here at the first. Before, when we were training our robot, we had it move to multiple positions and we took images. So it kind of shifts uh, the sequence of tasks that's done. Great, thanks. So, yeah, so we looked at um, now building that, um, so bought in the data and now we built built up this this network that can identify it so you, you don't have to wait till the entire network is identified right you don't have to wait till you have all your objects decided like here we only had two objects uh, recognized so our perception engineer has has built an algorithm for identifying two objects once we have that done we can have our planning engineer kind of take that uh, initial algorithm and start building the planning algorithm. So here you see our perception image is able to identify the mug and the membrane. And then we can start working on the second level, which is our plan and decide where we take the, the pose of the object based on the image. And then we decide how we're going to approach this. Um, so of course, because of how Simlink is built, you can, as, as your perception algorithm gets gets better and better, you would just go ahead and modify this block, right? You'd replace that original block with the new block so that the plan, planning engineer now can try uh, the new algorithm. It makes it really easy for you all to work in parallel and collaborate with each other, as each of you can be working on a separate block while everything works together in a single model. Ronald, that makes uh, sense. You, yeah, that that makes sense uh, for me at least. <laughs> in in this ex example, uh, we are obviously using AI, but uh, what other algorithms uh, could we use if we don't have data sets? Uh, could we compare an object to a CAD uh, per se? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we can we can definitely use sort of a template matching. Uh, I can I can pull up an example that we have here. Um, it's it's actually an example within our computer vision toolbox. Give me just a second while I pull that up. So here's an example of like pattern matching, right? So you would use an existing template. Uh, this can be a CAD template or an image template. And then you can take that template to try and identify this object within, uh, within say, an image frame that you get. And we've, we've, we're ship, we ship these examples for you to get started and see how you can use the tools to actually build up these applications. Awesome. So in this case, you're trying to pick up objects that aren't moving. But in some cases, specifically in the case of close human-robot collaboration, you might want to be able to track a person. If you're trying to feed them, then you want to track their face to be able to bring the food uh -huh. at the appropriate place. Or you might want to track the person to avoid colliding with them in the case you're sharing the workspace with a robot. So in that case, how can you do object tracking instead of just taking one picture and hoping that the target is still there once the robot moves. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a, I shouldn't have moved this example. This is actually another example we have right with our computer vision toolbox. Um, so here's one that we ship right with the toolbox where you can see we can track based on like a specific face. Um, we can track using uh, a type of um, actual car. Uh, we can even just look at motion and distinct that, okay, there is some motion, something's happening. So this is all using perception. We also have sense of fusion and tracking where we can identify a certain object, be it a LIDAR reading or a radar reading, and then track that object for the rest of the time. So in case of that human feeding uh, example, as you said, once, once the human, uh, the robot already knows where the human is, whereas the human decided to move a little back or to the right, the robot should be able to detect that, okay, the, the final pose that I want to get to has kind of changed, has shifted, and now moved there. This actually brings up a really good um, segue to my next uh, application, which is planning with safety in mind. So here, um, one thing that we can do with our planners is we can add obstacles as a part of the environment. So here you see two different, the same planning motion done two different times. Uh, once we have a shelf existing there, whereas the other time it doesn't exist. And you can see the two different paths that the robot took when we decided to add that obstacle to there. Now this is important because you have uh, multiple applications in which you will have your robot perform um, an operation again and again and again. And some of these times you might have a, um, a human standing uh, or multiple humans watching. So you wanna make sure when they keep replanning, there's a virtual boundary around which the robot should not move. So you can actually have obstacles that you pl put into your planning algorithm. So here, when we use our, our T planner for our manipulator, we can add virtual boundary boxes around which the robot will never plan. So that helps you add safety into the entire mix. Um, one more application that I wanna actually step on is uh, the simulation environment. Um, uh, Martin had mentioned um, when we started earlier that um, it's very common for you to train train your robots, your algorithms in a simulation environment as it's, as it's almost never heard of to buy 50,000 robots to just train it. So right, you can have these robots run in simulation and use that as, um, as your training environment. So if you were running in, in Simulink itself, you can definitely um, either, either connect to um, a ROS environment if that's, if that's available for your robot, or you can import um, the using either URDF, which is a very common format that's seen in robotics, or a CAD model, you can import these models directly into Simulink and use that to train your robot. So if I wanted to interact with another simulator that's 
not a gazebo on ROS or mm -hmm. the the simulator that's directly built in in MATLAB. For example, the the videos I showed earlier and the slides were based on Unreal Engine 4. So if I wanted to communicate with a robot that's simulated in an external environment like this, how would I do that in MATLAB? Great question. So with with Unreal and Gazebo, we specifically have built interfaces that make it really easy to interact with. So you don't have to actually have any communication protocol set up. We have blocks that let you communicate directly with Gazebo and directly with Unreal. So you can uh, send commands, bring in data, be it camera, LiDAR, or depth information from Unreal. Uh, if it was another simulator, such as um, any ROS-based simulator, then we have a ROS toolbox that lets you, uh, you know, add a jump in as a node, a no global node into that ROS network, and then you can interact with that ROS network. Right? This is actually a ROS-based um, simulation. Here we use publishers and subscribers to actually send commands to the robot. But if not, if if it's if it's not a ros based environment and you still want to connect, MATLAB actually gives you an open API. So you have means of using like if it's a network based environment, you can use um, UDP or TCP protocols. We give you blocks to connect directly to these network environments. If it's a serial mm -hmm. interface, then of course uh, we can give you um, it built right into MATLAB is COM interfaces so you can connect with these if they're plugged into your host machine. So there are multiple ways being an open API you can access or interface with external applications. I see then that, that means I can use also these protocols to communicate with uh, external uh, devices such as controllers for teleoperation. Absolutely, that's correct. Another, so, uh, uh, yeah. I also have a question. So here you, uh, in this, so far you have presented the uh, examples in both uh, in simulation and also deployed to hardware. What kind of modifications do we need to do to the template so that the user can switch between simulation and hardware deployment? I see, I was actually gonna go right into that. So we use the same template for going between simulation and uh, hardware actually, because we're almost everything stays the same either we're in simulation or hardware, the only change is we'll have the API change, right? So here you can see I have something called as a variant and I can move between hardware, a simulation or an external ROS environment. And so with Simulink, you, you get to build, build in different variants and all you would do is go click on, click on the block that has the variant, go in and select that variant. And once you select that variant, you'll be connected communicating with that hardware. So it makes it really easy to test your simulation in Simulink itself, uh, connect to an external um, simulator if, if that's how you're working with or connect to your hardware. It's very similar to what we were talking about here when we had sort of a brain uh, communication interface uh, rather than hard coding what you want your robot to do. Um, Another important application when it comes to these um, external simulators, I think um, Martin had Martin had mentioned that it's common for uh, these trainings to happen. Uh, if you're working within Simlink itself, you can accelerate the training of, of your agents, be it your reinforcement learning agent, by running these in parallel. So then you know you can have like a host send copies to uh, copies of the agent that you're training and the environment to each worker. And then you can have like the agent and the environment send their data back to the host. And be, as long as you're working in Simulink, we can automatically update your, your agent and your policy if it was a reinforcement learning application. If you're working external to Simulink, then you would have to manage the policy updates by yourself, but that's still possible when you're training, say you're training in parallel for multiple all right, so the last thing I had for today was just the takeaways. Um, we, we walked through like the entire process of building a pick and place application. We looked at how you can connect to the, the actual platform, how you can use sensory devices such as cameras to bring in images or point clouds. Uh, we walked through building sort of a, um, 
a deep learning uh, network that can identify this. Um, and then we looked at like um, some of the planning and um, overall supervisory control, how you, Simlink can help you with that. And um, some one of the things you probably noticed in this is we had all these different domains be control, um, computer vision, perception, all of that built right in the same uh, Simlink model. So another thing is we have all these complex workflows uh, that we can achieve within Simlink and MATLAB itself. Uh, one thing that I probably did not mention was model-based design. Um, you kind of uh, pointed to it. With model-based design is our, our development uh, sort of framework, right? So we can start within Simlink as a model. We use that for simulation. We use that for validating and verifying your algorithm. And that same model can be used to actually deploy your model to your hardware. Um, then, of course, um, we showed some integration with other tools, such as uh, Gazebo and Unreal. Uh, it, MATLAB and Simlink make it really easy to integrate with external uh, simulators. Uh, we make it. Uh, we actually built in a lot of uh, functionality to um, run C++ code or integrate with Python code. Um, we have sort of an extensive suite of products uh, with our toolboxes, uh, and with that, a single platform can sort of provide the entire solution uh, for most of the applications that you're trying to build. So that's really all I had for you today. Um, the, the floor is open for any questions that you may have. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Ronald. Um, before we open the group to everyone for questions, I also want to add a comment here. One of the reasons I really like about this simulating template for robotics is that it makes deploying a robot into any projects easier. So six years ago, when I was building a pick and place demo and having the robot try to go around human, where human can't seem to work, its workspace, it took more than six months to get the first version working and everything has to be hard coded. But right now with the temp with this template in Simulink and also all the toolboxes provided and the examples provided in MATLAB and Simulink, a lot of those steps can be automated. You don't need to hard code any of those pieces Rather, you just grab and uh, pick and grab and drop into the simulating model, and then it makes your uh, it can and customize it for your application. So a lot of the uh, the job that uh, previously takes a robotics engineer to develop now can be done with those tools. You don't have to be trained in robotics to add robots to your projects now. So with that, thank you, and now uh, I would like to open the floor for questions. There was one question, uh, you, from uh, from a participant. He wanted to know, does the Kinova API support Simulink uh, real-time? So you, you can send commands uh, through the Kinova API directly from Simulink. However, you cannot send real-time commands directly from the API. So you cannot, the low-level API I discussed, I mentioned briefly earlier in the presentation is uh, only available through our uh, external API in uh, C++ or Python. I do see Jared uh, Lawson asking if um, we, We'll be uploading this video. We are recording it, and I, you, I believe this will be available. Yep, it'll be available, and also we will provide a link to download this template too. Um, but once you download it, you have to kind of like well, you run it. You have to confirm you have access to all the two boxes. If you are with a university, that shouldn't be a problem. But if you are with a commercial entity and maybe need some of those two boxes, feel free to reach out uh, to us, the panelists in this uh, this conversation. So I also see Don Riley asking an example for the interface to Kinova was an API to MATLAB. Why not use the ROS interface? Don, um, Kinova does provide a ROS package that you can use. 
Um, the last simulation that you saw was actually using the ROS package within Gazebo. And um, if you go to the Kinova um, GitHub, you'll also see how you can communicate with that ROS package, what commands are available, what topics are available for you to uh, control the robot. Yes, to, to complete the answer, the, the, sh the short answer of why we use that for the example is that the, it, you, you can skip at least one layer of implementation by working directly from MATLAB to Simulink, uh, fr from Simulink to, uh, to the Kinova arm. So you don't, if you don't need other NOS nodes, uh, ROS nodes, sorry, then you, you can skip ROS entirely and just work with MATLAB. And also, Martin, I remember there are certain there are certain applications where the customers may not want to use ROS as a mid layer. Is that correct? Yes. So, uh, as a general rule, if you want to use the robot, uh, there was a question about this just a minute ago. If you want to use a robot for real time applications, if you need to have uh, instant response or a millisecond response from the robot, you will need to use the low level API, which is not available through ROS because it, it inserts too much delay with the commands. Additionally, uh, if anyone wants to go on and mute and ask a question, feel free to do that. Um, we'd be happy to take your questions. Do we see any questions from the chat right now? Um, I did not receive any. I see one asking if the Kinoma ARMS kinematic model is available in MATLAB. Yes, as a part of the robotic system toolbox, you can actually load this um, URDF directly into MATLAB. So you can you can try different um, examples with the Kinova ARM. We have the Kinova Gen 3 arm within the robotic system toolbox library. Also, one of the reasons I like about the Kinova Gen 3 arm is it has the, the camera on the wrist built in so that you don't need to spend a lot of time doing the uh, external camera setup. And this camera is Intel RealSense, so it provides that depth information as well. And Martin, I know you are also uh, coming up with a new arms in Kino from Kinova, right? Do you want to take a, a minute and tell us about that? Yeah, so first I can discuss the Gen 3 Lite. You haven't seen it in the videos here. It's a robot that we, uh, that we released uh, now about a year ago. The purpose of this robot is to be used mostly for education. It's an ultra lightweight robot. The, the goal was to make a robot that's professional that you can do all, all the regular tasks uh, of a robot with it in theory, but drive the cost down as much as possible so that uh, researchers or professors in universities or college can use m many of those robots in their class for their students rather than have one gigantic car lifting a hundred thousand dollar robot that they can only do demonstrations with. We'd rather have a robot that's inherently safe uh, but still, uh, that's still cheap and also uh, that you can do all of the applications with them. So that robot was the, the Gen 3 Lite robot. Uh, that works on the Cortex API, which means you can also integrate it in all the templates we showed today. Yeah, that, that's a good point, uh, actually, Martin, uh, uh, regarding scalability, because the Gen 3 Lite is a very uh, accessible robot. Uh, six uh, degree of freedoms, full robot, uh, and it's very accessible. But I mean, since they're all run running on the same system, uh, you can have uh, one gentry unit for more complex or more uh, heavy, uh, heavy burden uh, applications because the payload uh, obviously is higher. Uh, but you can have smaller units like gentry lights. So you can have a full uh, complete lab solution with uh, different products. 
you don't have to shift into another universe or other product line, uh, other manufacturers. So that's a very uh, um, interesting solution to go with, if I can add up to. And also, Kenova is always uh, uh, looking to the, the future and uh, new markets. Uh, so industrial is really a big, big segment. Everything, everyone knows that. Um, and uh, uh, we are always looking to, to do research and development for, for new products that will be uh, very suitable for, for these markets. Thank you, Mark and Dre. So Ronald, we have a question from the chat. Can we easily try our own algorithm in Kinova? Yes. So as a part of the robotic system toolbox, we, we provide the Kinova models and some examples for you to get started. You can definitely modify these examples as you'd like and test how they work with the Kinova. I would actually recommend you go try those if you have access to the tools. Yeah, I also know uh, we provide the, a feature called Manipulator RRT. It's a one-line command that helps you do path planning for robot to do, to do motion planning for the robot arm. But we, like in the template, we also offer another option where you can, like, uh, we actually implement a script to do, Q, uh, to do quadratic programming, an uh, optimization method that helps you do, uh, it's like an optimization algorithm for path planning as well. So you can either use our feature or write your own script. To add on the, the answer to the question, it if you wish, you can also use our low-level API and be able to uh, insert the transfer function of your controller directly in the firmware of, of the actuators. So you could, you could still use MATLAB for all your high-level planning and uh, Cartesian motion uh, obstacle avoidance, but you could have your uh, controller model uploaded directly on the robot and running in real time inside the robot, even if you're using uh, MATLAB to send on the side all the targets and using it to fetch the images from your camera, for example. Cool. Thank you, Martin. Um, we are at the end of the hour. If you have more questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us, uh, to the presenters. And our emails are just our name at either mathworks.com or kinova.com, uh, kinova.ca. So it could be very straightforward. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on this webinar. And uh, it was a great pleasure to have Ronald, Martin, Mark, and Dre on the board to uh, tell us this story. Thank you.